Scanners. It should not, it's now it's now live, so I thought we can make it but um, I think maybe we can just flip we can flip to the PowerPoints there like that. Yeah. Okay. Do you want a slideshow? Yes. Excellent. Okay, yeah, Okay, uh, welcome everyone. It's very so pleasure to uh, meet again and uh, uh, welcome uh, Brandon Taylorian, who is a, an associate lecturer here at Lancaster University and also at UCLan. And Brandon is going to be talking about religious freedom, uh, religious freedom issues, and the colonial legacy of state recognition. And this is from his PhD, uh, which yeah. is near, near completion. Uh, submitted. Now. Submitted. Yeah. So yeah. Just waiting for the either. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you're joining joining us online. Um, you can ask Brandon uh, questions in the Q and A box. I've, I've put a little message up uh, already, but uh, just to just to remind you. So uh, we'll do a Q and A uh, session after Brandon has finished. Thanks so much, James. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you everyone for coming today. Uh, I'd like to say a big thank you to James and the Centre for International Law and Human Rights for hosting this this uh, um, lecture for me today. And hopefully, I do the subject justice. Today, um, as James said, I did this for my PhD, uh, which I've just submitted, and I'm now waiting um, for my viva, which I'm thinking it might be in kind of January time, perhaps, or February. So um, I'm a little bit stressed at the moment with that, but uh, hopefully it should all be okay. Um, as James mentioned, today's lecture is about recognition registration issues. Uh, and the lecture today is going to be split into three sections. First of all, I'll give you a kind of tour of recognition and registration issues in the world today. Then we'll look at the international responses to these issues from uh, the European Court of Human Rights, for instance, the United Nations, etc. And then finally, I will be introducing some new research that I'm conducting at the moment uh, that I hope to continue uh, in postdoc. Um, on the impacts of colonialism on uh, religious freedom. So I've got quite a few things to get through today. But first of all, um, just to give you a little bit of background, I conducted uh, an interview series for my PhD uh, and I had two categories. The first category was uh, human rights lawyers, people working in the United Nations, people active in the field essentially of religious freedom. The second group were people on the ground. These were people who were part of religious minorities, uh, new religious groups who had actually faced these issues themselves personally. One of the, um, I was lucky enough to be able to interview uh, the UN Special Rapporteur, Heiner Bierfeld, um, for Freedom of Religion and Belief. Uh, and when I started to talk to him about recognition and registration issues, one of the things, first things he recommended I do we split recognition from registration, distinguish them uh, and establish some kind of uh, definition or understanding of, of how they are different from one another. So here we go. This is what I sort of developed. So recognition is a social cultural process yeah, in which a religion or belief gradually gains validation, acknowledgement in society. So you could say that this is the relationship between a religion and the society itself. The, a lot of the recognition issues that I'll be talking about today uh, stem from whenever states, governments try to influence this process of recognition, okay? Try and sort of intervene in this process and place up obstacles in the way of this ongoing kind of natural process of gradual acknowledgement of, of religious diversity. So that's recognition. Then we have registration, which can be understood as kind of the legal counterpart to recognition or legal recognition, you could say. And as I put there, it is a procedure in which a religious organization gains personality in law. OK, so you could understand this to be the direct relationship between religious groups and the state. OK, so recognition is uh, relationship between religions and society, 
registration is a that direct relationship between religious groups and the state. Okay, and this is how I'm going to be uh, understanding recognition and registration throughout the lecture today. Just to start off with recognition issues, first of all, uh, one of the things that I found during the course of my research was that uh, gaining recognition or, or being recognised uh, for your religion uh, can have a detrimental impact if you don't if you don't get that recognition on your economic and social mobility in society. And of course, this was um, some of the views that came from from people who actually faced these issues uh, themselves personally. Um, and of course, on top of that, if the state, as I mentioned, is trying to impede in this process of recognition, um, that obviously creates um, further issues. So we've got state misrecognition here, which is a key concern. This is when governments actively try and distort what a religious group is or how pu the public perceive a religious group. Um, so they may refer to it as a cult, for example, or as an extremist group. We'll look at some examples here today uh, of, of when governments have done that. And of course, this is trying to influence public attitudes towards whatever religious group has been targeted, which then leads to increased rates of discrimination and persecution, of course. Now, um, unsurprisingly, the groups that are most affected by these issues um, are firstly minority communities. So I've given you the example there of the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar, who's, um, who have been sort of misrecognised by the government in Myanmar for, for decades. But of course, that in 2017 uh, culminated in the genocide that took place against the Rohingya Muslims. Um, but what we need to understand is that, that that was taking place over the course of many, many years. And um, at that point, the society in, in Myanmar had kind of, public opinion had turned against the Rohingya Muslims. And so that kind of justified the ability for governments to get away with it, um, with their sort of persecution. We've also got new religious groups that face these kinds of issues. So again, I'm giving the example there of the Jehovah's Witnesses in Russia. In 2017, the Russian government uh, banned the Jehovah's Witnesses and labeled them extremists. Again, this is a way of trying to influence the public attitudes towards these groups. Um, the, for example, the Jehovah's Witnesses aren't gonna be able to gain much public sympathy or support if the public believes what the government is saying, that this is a dangerous group to society, uh, that this is this is you know some type, some kind of cult, for example. So it's, again, just a way of influencing this recognition process. And then we've also got schismatic groups, which can also be minority and new religious groups, but they're a little bit distinct in the sense that they are groups that have diverged from the majority religion. So you've got the Ahmadi Muslims um, who, there's a big population of them in, in Pakistan. Um, and the issue is that the Pakistani government and quite a few other Islamic governments do not recognize the Ahmadi Muslims as Muslims. Okay, So that then causes a lot of um, issues for that, that group in society. Okay, so some, Key issues there include obviously this misrecognition. Yeah, um, just looking at it from kind of the state uh, religion relations kind of approach. So um, you've got first of all this issue of state privilege. So this is when a secular state claims, uh, well, it claims to be secular, but in actual fact, it still privileges one religion over another. So we see this in, I've given the example there on the board of the Catholic Church in South America. Quite a few countries in South America claim to be secular, but in practice, they do privilege the Catholic Church over all other religious groups. So again, that's causing inequality in how the government treats those groups. We've also got, and this is probably what you're most um, familiar with, religious establishment. Uh, so this is when a government obviously actively advocates for a certain religion. So um, the term state religion is often used or official religion. 
um, which there can be hostile forms of that. So you can find that in the Middle East, in, um, North Africa, Southeast Asia. So that's when a state religion actually has a detrimental impact on the human rights record of a country. Um, but then you can find benign forms of this. So look at places like Denmark, which has a state religion, but has one of the highest, best human rights records in the world. Okay, so it's not always a detriment to religious freedom in that sense. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, governments sometimes actively try and weaponize certain labels against religious groups. So I've mentioned cult and extremist already. You might also find them using words like foreign groups or untraditional religions, things like that. This is essentially just a way to um, hierarchize religions. Yeah, um, the religions that are new, unfamiliar to society, minorities, they're usually at the bottom of these hierarchies. The religions at the top are usually ones that have been established for a long time. Uh, they're ingrained in the culture. Uh, they have a lot of political power as well, perhaps. Okay. Here's a map that I've created. Uh, I keep updating this every year um, because some of the categories change you know, all the time. But this is a map of religious recognition, really. Um, so it's essentially looking at is, is a country secular or not? So uh, the countries that are in orange, I've identified as possessing some kind of state privilege, so some kind of unequal treatment yeah, of, of religions. Um, the countries in red or dark red are ones that still practice a state religion or official religion. And then you've got China over there, which still practices state atheism as well, which is quite an interesting policy, uh, but has in a way state atheism is kind of hostility to all religion. OK, so essentially the reason why I'm showing you this is just to show the, the, the diversity of how states interact with religions okay, in different parts of the world. Um, one of the things that emerged out of my interview series were arguments for and against this kind of favoritism for religions. So just looking at the arguments for it, these are used by state officials uh, at the highest levels of places like the UN where they're talking about religious freedom issues. Um, they have to try and defend why are you treating one religion uh, better than another, okay? Uh, and these are some examples they give. So things like, well, we're preserving our cultural heritage, uh, we're preserving traditions. They may even try and integrate it with elements of nationhood, even safety and security, um, public <coughs> order, things like that. All these different things are used, and I call these narrative tools. These are what states use to justify elevating uh, certain religions and restricting others. Okay. Just moving over to registration issues now. So as I said earlier, registration is a legal procedure. Uh, it's, it's establishing a relationship between a religious group and the state. And there are three main benefits of this. There are financial benefits including most often tax exempt status for the religious group, not always, but most often. Uh, legal provisions, so that includes having your religion recognised as a, as a religion in law and protected. So that's important for areas of employment, marriage, okay? And then finally, the most problematic benefit of registration is when um, registration is placed, is used as a condition to access rights. OK, so even though countries, um, many of these governments have made commitments at the international level and they've said, yes, we, we advocate for religious freedom. Some of them have said, well, in order to access those rights at the national level, your group has to register with the state. OK, and when I go through some of the registration issues on the next slide, uh, it'll become more clear as to why that's a problem. Um, but ultimately, a lack of registration has implications for exercising the full range of religious rights, essentially. And also things like conscientious objection, converting from one religion to another. OK. Just to go a little bit deeper on this, so here are some of the key registration issues that I identified during my research. So the main one at the top there, the most concerning one, 
is mandatory registration orders. So this is where a state uh, ha um, has this policy where uh, you have to register as a religious group. You cannot exist legally in a country unless you register. And this is a growing issue. So as of 2022, I've written there, 76 countries and territories practice this kind of order. Um, this establishes um, kind of an authoritarian um, landscape for religious groups to exist within um, because it, it forces them into registration essentially. They cannot legally exist without it. Further issues include limiting access to registration. Registration is not always accessible to religious groups. States may say, well, you have to have a certain amount of members to register, or you have to have existed for a certain amount of time in the country before you can register. Okay, so that's an issue there if you can't access that legal procedure. Also, sometimes registration is made very, very cumbersome, very laborious. Sometimes it can take decades uh, for religious groups to achieve registration, um, essentially because some of these states don't want these groups to achieve legal uh, personality. They don't want them to achieve uh, any kind of protections. And also a key one here is how registration is used for surveillance. Okay, so registration is a way for states to collect information about religious groups. Um, who's attending these religious group, these religious services, who are the leaders of these religious groups, okay? And that information is then used later on by governments, and there's many examples of this, um, to conduct raids on religious places of worship, on private residences of group members and leaders, and even to conduct arrests, and even harassment as well of religious group members, okay? So registration is a very powerful tool. It's a powerful tool in terms of collecting information. It's also a powerful tool in terms of influencing and controlling um, religious activity. Here I go with the map again. Uh, this one is looking at registration policies by country. Um, so as you can see, the, the ones in the red here, uh, they are mandatory registration countries, as I said earlier. Uh, which affect most of Asia, most of Africa, a few countries there in South America. Um, in Europe, uh, it, that is less of an issue, but there are still ongoing problems in, in European countries with regards to registration. Uh, but it, again, it just shows you the breadth of these issues, that this is a global matter. It's not just in terms of, you know, it's not just an issue in Europe, it's not just an issue in Asia different places around the world have this have this issue. So I just want to look at a couple of case studies just to give you a flavour of, of what's actually taking place on the ground in a few places and also to kind of reiterate the fact that in different parts of the world these issues are affecting. So here is Angola, the South Af Southern African country of Angola. The main thing to look at here is the fact that in Angola they request 60,000 member signatures for religious groups to register, uh, which is a huge amount. That's a huge amount. Um, the issue is that the government in Angola also says that registration is mandatory to legally exist. So religious groups in this country find themselves between a rock and a hard place because if you don't have 60,000 members, you can't legally register and so therefore you can't legally exist. So there's this kind of circular situation going on here. Uh, and Angola is not the only example of this. There's many other examples uh, that where this kind of phenomenon is taking place. Essentially, it's just a way to stop new religious groups from emerging, isn't it? Uh, it's a way to kind of limit what religious groups can, can gain kind of legal personality, okay? or any kind of recognition in society. Moving over to Europe, Austria has quite a problematic system. Um, I refer to it as kind of a vertical system because it has um, kind of three levels to it. So um, the government places religious groups into these different levels uh, according to membership size, how long they've existed for, and whether even whether the beliefs of that group are familiar to the state as well. Um, and essentially, the higher up the hierarchy you are, 
the more benefits you get from the government, essentially, and the better treated you are in many ways. Um, also, a growing trend is here at the bottom where it says about associations. So, um, in, you know, oftentimes in some of these hierarchies, uh, religions at the bottom are just referred to as associations. They are stripped of their religious nature. They're stripped of their kind of religious character and they're referred to just as NGOs, essentially. To kind of distinguish them from the legitimate religions at the top of the hierarchy. Okay, so again, lots of inequality going on here uh, and recognition and registration at the center of this. Um, Bolivia, moving across to South America, just to give you a flavor of what's taking place here. Um, the main thing to look at is this big paragraph here, uh, which is all of the documents that the Bolivian government requests of religious groups in order to register. And I've put that in there just to show how ridiculously long it is a full list of members they ask for for religious groups. Again, you know, is this in alignment with religious freedom? Not really, you know. Uh, what do they want to use this information for should be the main concern uh, for human rights advocates, okay. Um, and Bolivia is not the only one. If I put China up here, that it would fill the whole screen of the things they request. Uh, but also other countries as well. Many countries are practicing this. Finally, just to give you a flavour of what's going on in the Middle East region, uh, you've got Iran here, which of course has a state denomination of Shia Islam, uh, but it also recognises three recognised religious minorities uh, of Christians, Jews and Zoroastrians. The problem is that if the Iranian government does not recognise you as a Christian, then you cannot legally exist in the country. Um, so I know that a lot of Protestant groups have had trouble there gaining that kind of recognition from the Iranian government over the last few decades. Um, and also as well, if you fall out of any of those recognised religious minorities, so if you're a Baha'i, for example, that's a minority in Iran, um, essentially not allowed to have any kind of legal personality. You don't have any protections in the law which is very concerning. OK, so hopefully that just gives you a flavour of some of the things that are taking place around the world. Um, so essentially, recognition and registration have a detrimental impact on various aspects of uh, society. We've got recognition and registration being from, uh, you know, kind of um, helping things like apostasy, blasphemy, supporting those kinds of laws being continued. Um, things like discrimination, of course, are, are recognition and registration play a role in there, um, as well as censorship, citizenship as well is also um, affected by recognition and registration. As I said earlier, surveillance and control, registration is very powerful in that regard. And also, as I said very earlier on about violence, even though recognition and registration may seem um, quite minute problems when it comes in comparison to like major genocides taking place, what I found in my research was that some of these issues are signs of, of initial signs of worse things to come in the future. Okay, um, so that is why it's particularly important to me to kind of advocate for these issues. Um, here are some of the themes that came out from my thesis. Um, one of them at the top there was a tension between cultural relativism and the universality of human rights. Obviously religious freedom is a universal right, but countries I've found have been increasingly taking advantage of culture as a way to suppress or undermine religious freedom, okay? That we have a right to culture, that, that, that religion is part of our culture. If you remember when I was talking earlier about um, some of the, the narrative tools states are using, so that there is a tension there between those two, two uh, elements. Uh, we also have exclusivism versus inclusivism. So some states have very narrow ideas of what legitimate religion is, some states have more open, uh, pluralistic ideas. So again, there's a tension there. 
Um, we've also got, as I said, various different narrative tools being used. And then we've got the reinterpretation of religious freedom at the national level. So religious freedom has international definitions. You can take a look at those in the EDHR, in the ICCPR, uh, in the European Convention of Human Rights, okay? But religious freedom has been um, watered down in some countries at the national level, and what it actually includes. Um, the wording can be changed at the national level as to what actually religious freedom protects. And so again, it's a way of kind of eroding the full force of what religious freedom is. And so again, I found recognition and registration as being part of that uh, erosion of, of the full force of, of religious freedom. So you're probably wondering at this stage, what has been the international response to these issues? Well, there has been responses um, by the OSCE, which is, it is a great organisation. It's the Organisation of Security and Cooperation in Europe. It advocates for human rights and democracy. They published in 2014 a document uh, to address some of these issues. Um, I kind of, in my thesis, um, pulled that apart and tried to identify a lot of the inadequacies in there. Uh, um, one of them being that it was published 10 years ago. Uh, we need an update, we need um, more precision. Um, some of the issues that I've identified were left out of this document, so there's quite a few inadequacies there. We need an update on that. In terms of the UN Special Rapporteur, this is the present year, um, UN Special Rapporteur for, for Freedom of Religion or Belief. Um, I feel that their response on these issues has been too soft. Um, they haven't specified which countries are, you know, restricting religion through recognition and registration enough, in my opinion. Uh, and again, I spoke about that in my thesis. Um, looking at the European cause of human rights, their rulings tend to be very reactionary, so there's a lot of court cases on registration issues, but they tend not to get to the, to the kind of deeper level issues. So they tend not to address why countries are recognising one religion over another. Um, you could argue, do they have the capacity to do that? And I spoke about that in, in some of my interviews, but there is an issue there of it not of being too reactionary and not preventative. You know? uh, also, um, here are some just some of the court rulings. You might want to take a picture or note of those if you're interested in um, looking at some of these uh, court rulings that have taken place. Um, the one that I want to just focus in on was this, the, the Granger case in 2009 in the UK Employment Appeal Tribunal. Uh, um, it essentially ended with um, this, the greater criteria being created, which is to try to establish what is a protectable belief in the law, okay, in UK law. But obviously, this is just in the UK. This is, these are global issues that I'm talking about, so it doesn't have as much impact um, as what it, what it could do. Uh, but if something like this was created for the European level, you know, or, or even an international criteria, maybe that is the way to go. Okay, so this is a criteria for the protectability of a belief. Trying to establish what is a religion in the context of religious freedom, essentially. So again, some of the key concerns I've got is that there's not enough international standards uh, on this issue. Uh, this is why countries are able to get away with these kinds of policies because there isn't enough um, kind of um, attention to some of the more granular issues, um, some of the more specific area issues. Uh, last, not enough theoretical development. This is something I addressed in my thesis. Um, I tried to create kind of new terms for some of these issues, um, new concepts, new approaches. We need more theoretical development from scholars and again clearer guidance from the Strasbourg Court as well. Um, there's ongoing issues with the fact that the Strasbourg Court advocate for pluralism, multiculturalism in a very diversifying world, but countries and, and even scholars have argued that they've not um, 
given enough guidance on actually how to achieve that, how to like, practically maintain pluralism, multiculturalism in a very diverse religious landscape. Okay. And one thing I will also find out is that, um, that some of these recognition registration issues are intensifying because of globalization, because new religious groups are emerging all the time, because people are interacting with each other, okay, in terms of interreligious conflict and things. So this is going to be an issue that will continue, I think. Um, it's, it's not just one that is um, it's going to take place now, it's, it's one that will um, con continue to worsen if we don't have some kind of standards in place. Um, so as part of my thesis, I try to, well at the end, I try to kind of put a positive spin on all of this, on all these issues, and I try to develop what I call facilitationism, which basically is just a fancy word for um, trying to, to show that recognition and registration can be used for good. Yes, they're used bad and they're used to, um, to the detriment of religious freedom, but they can be used for good and they do have positive impacts in terms of interfaith dialogue they can help with. Um, some of the benefits of registration are good, so like financial benefits, helping religious groups thrive and grow. So there are positive aspects of it, we just need more equal systems in which they're applied. Okay. Uh, this is a report that came out this year that I created with, with Summer, who is one of the students here today. Um, and I'm also starting on the 2024 report now, so if anyone uh, is interested in volunteering to help create this report for next year, uh, I'll be more than welcome um, to get any kind of help with that because um, th there is uh, a lack of, of uh, shall we say, um, research going on in this area. So if anyone is interested in that, please do just let me know. Okay, so just for the last five, ten minutes or so of the lecture today, I wanted to look, tell you a little bit about how kind of colonialism plays a role in all of this. Because of course recognition and registration issues haven't just emerged in the 20, 21st century, uh, they have a long history and in my postdoc work I want to look at where they originate from and where they began to accelerate because I think you have to understand the history in order to understand why we're facing these issues today that I've just explained to you all. Um, so again this research is ongoing, it's, this is new stuff that I'm um, testing out today in a way, um, but so far I've wanted to focus really on the sort of mid 18th century um, and the fact that there seemed to be, particularly among um, the West at the time, a kind of mentality of superiority among Christian missionaries. So when they started to uh, venture into Africa um, and take what David Livingston calls the three C's to Africa, so Christianity, commerce and civilization, what I realised was that they um, were taking Christianity as a, as a way of civilising primitive peoples um, and that they in a way wanted to use Christianity to um, kind of support imperial uh, expansion as well a little bit later on in the century. And of course Darwinian theory was used in a similar way to misuse shall we say um, during this period. Um, by some scholars it was said that there is like a hierarchy of races for example um, and this also applies in terms of religion. There's also a hierarchy of religions, Christianity being at the top and indigenous religions uh, being at the bottom. Okay, um, So again this should start to become clear as some of the links between uh, inequality and some of the recognition issues that we just spoke about today, this kind of hierarchy of religions. Um, so this is what I'm going to try and speak about in terms of <coughs> this new research. This is quite an interesting map that I found recently. Um, it was by an American, uh, W.C. Woodbridge, who was a cartographer in 1820, and it just shows the religious populations of the world. 
But interestingly enough, it also refers to states of civilization. And these often corresponded to what religion those states were. Um, so uh, you've got the most enlightened countries, obviously Western Europe and kind of the former 13 colonies in the United States, they were enlightened. They were Christian civilizations. Okay. Then if you go one level down, you've got the civilized, which usually is that kind of like South America area. Why are they civilized? Because they'd accepted Catholicism from the missionaries. Okay, so they were not quite on the European level, but they were getting there kind of idea. Okay, and then if you go right down to the bottom, you've got what they refer to as savage or barbarous. These are people who are practicing um, indigenous traditional religions and often referred to as fetishists or uh, idolaters, heathens, for example. But it just shows this map, it's kind of an epitome of the attitude at the time, yeah. That there is this hierarchy of civilizations, but also that there is a hierarchy of religions, okay? Because more primitive people, in quote marks, um, would obviously practice lesser religions and Christianity was gonna be used as a way to civilize these people, to bring them up to the European level, okay? So it's quite interesting to look at a map like that, just to give you an idea of how they used to think at this, uh, during this time. Of course, this led to a lot of misrecognition, like I was talking about earlier. So referring to these people as pagans or fetishists, as I said, this is still going on today, isn't it? With as I said earlier, referring to groups as extremists or cool, these labels are still being used just in different ways. Okay. Um, you've also got this definitive attitude, dismissiveness, you know, a dismissiveness of any non-Christian religion at the time. Um, as any, they used to refer to them as kind of superstitions rather than actual religions. They didn't actually recognize them as religions more like superstitions or even witchcrafts often referred to as well, or just paganism was used. So a lot of sort of misunderstandings emerged of non-Christian religions and this uh, actually filtered down from the Western study of religions which emerged during this time. Um, the study of religions has always been through a Western kind of, uh, ever since then through a Western paradigm so again, some of these misunderstandings continue today of Eastern religions or any just non-Christian religion. You've also got to remember about the, the element of imperialism going on at the time. So a lot of these um, attitudes played in very well for the imperialist agenda. As I said earlier, Christianity was used as a way of um, bolstering kind of the expansionist um, ideals or agenda of various different empires at the time, um, which was also, uh, as I've put there, there was this enduring sense of entitlement among the West to kind of, to the other cultures of the world, okay? Here again are just some examples that I've put up here on the screen. Obviously, I've just spoken mainly about the Western colonial powers there's a lot of other examples of how religion has been misused for imperial purposes. You've got uh, Islam by the Ottoman Empire being misused. You've got state Shinto in Japan during the imperial period of Japan being misused uh, in various ways. Um, even atheism being misused in the Soviet Union as a way of um, stamping out all religion, of course, during that period in Russian history. Um, so again, it just shows that in various different parts of the world, religion has been used as a way of um, suppression, really, uh, of, of minority groups, new religious groups, uh, or any group that is that kind of at the periphery of society. As we see earlier today, when I was talking about those groups that have been the most affected by recognition issues, uh, just to come towards the end here, so two of the main products of these attitudes, one of them was Orientalism, of course. Um, so the idea that the East is um, uh, frozen in time, 
that it's that it was weak, dangerous perhaps, um, the eccentric, irrational, and then the West was everything opposite to that. The West was developed, it was dependable, it was masculine presented as, it was, it was presented as kind of almost um, doing these other civilizations a favor in a way by bringing Christianity to them, yeah? Um, and you can find this in terms of art, so obviously I've included a, a piece of art there at the back, but you can find this in terms of art, literature, okay? These ideas are very widespread at the time, and in sort of 1800s going into the, the, um, the 20th century, okay? And of course this had a detrimental impact on how, particularly Hindus, Muslims, and those practicing African traditional religion were kind of stereotyped and presented. Um, in some instances, they're even presented as almost animalistic, uh, particularly those at the what were considered at the bottom of the hierarchy uh, in places um, in sort of Africa and, and uh, the, even the Aboriginal Australians as well. So again, it just shows that there's this this hierarchy. Okay. And then finally, uh, the second product of this, in a way, was was religious exoticism, as a way. So, kind of aestheticizing, but also appropriating other religions, okay, by the by the West, um, which of course was then used as a means of exploitation later on, um, again for imperial uh, purposes. Looking at the post-colonial landscape. You've got Eastern religions being changed to suit Western audiences. So if you think about like yoga, meditation, shamanism, these are all from the East and they've been brought over to the West, changed, repackaged for Western audiences. Okay. Um, particularly important for what we talked about earlier, some of these former colonies established state religions uh, when they gained independence. And I tend to say that they did this to kind of mark their independence and autonomy from their previous rulers. So if you look at North Africa, for example, um, all of those countries, Egypt, Libya, uh, Algeria, they were all former colonies and they all have state religions now. So in a sense, you could say that the, the remnants of colonialism kind of exist there, okay, um, in an indirect way, of course. And then finally, uh, we've, got, we've got some kind of contemporary manifestations, as I said, of these colonial remnants. So discrimination in how new or unfamiliar religions are treated, equality in some of those recognition and registration issues that I talked about earlier, weaponizing terms, I spoke about that quite, quite a lot today. And then finally, in a way, perpetuating like religious hegemony, which is essentially what recognition and registration are used to do, isn't it? Okay, so there's some references and resources there and uh, thank you all for listening. Um, if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to take those. <laughs> And uh, I'll just, uh, yes, yes, the, uh, <laughs> the people who are joining us online, uh, just tell them that they can send questions. Um, um, you want to contact me over email, it's b.r.taylorian at Lancaster. Okay, so everyone joining us online, uh, you can pose your questions, Brandon, in the uh, Q and A box. Um, every, everyone else, um, please, the floor is open. If you have any questions for Brandon. Um, so basically, this is just like uh, philosophical, but I just want to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, basically, I feel like if we hear about religion, it sounds like more, you know, more of legal term or something like that right. compared to belief. So in your opinion, what is the most different things? Because I'm coming from Indonesia and I know yeah. diversity and then, as you mentioned, recognize as a one of the rules that we should, you know, register our religion. Yeah. but. 
sometimes I feel like the government really, you know, confused to describe the difference between religion and then belief because religion it sounds like more like based on regulation, yeah. yeah. But belief it's really, you know, I, I feel like the expansion of the definitions is really important. So just want to hear from you. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Um, well, everything that I've just said there as well. Also, I spoke about religion, but I also spoke about belief, and that includes. Um, even like atheist groups or I mean I spoke during uh, my interviews to a humanist um, who wouldn't say that he's part of a religion but he's part of a, a belief group um, so it, it does have um, an impact on any kind of group that, that shares a belief it doesn't have to be religious it can be spiritual or or um, philosophical uh, um, so Essentially, yes, even though we talk about religion quite often, um, it does impact, these issues do impact um, kind of any group, as I said, that, that share a belief or, or a community that share a belief. Um, but yeah, in terms of religion as an institution, um, well, I spoke about it, I don't know if I spoke about it earlier, but um, what we need is more protection for religious organisations because governments in a way have tried to get around their commitments to religious freedom by restricting the organisations which obviously has a, has a detrimental impact on individuals but organisations have much less protection at the international level than individuals have in terms of human rights so governments have kind of found a bit of a loophole there they can restrict the, the religious group they're not necessarily restricting the uh, individuals directly, you know. So there is still an importance there for institutional rights, if you know what I mean. But it doesn't have much support at the international level. So ongoing issues there, but really good question. Thank you. Anyone else got any questions? <coughs> Online, I think no, no questions online at the moment. No. Mm -hmm. I've got one. Like, if we start, I'd like to say, recognizing yeah. like more and more minority groups as like religion to my like, organization. Can we go before it like then becomes too much? Yeah, well, some some comments have said that they've said. Um, I think Belarus is an example there uh, that I know of that has said we're not recognising anymore, we've recognised enough now. Um, but obviously that goes against the principles of diversity, doesn't it? Um, so I would have to say there isn't an end to that. Uh, the more, uh, the, it kind of endless really. Um, every person on the planet has a right to religious freedom. Um, and so in theory, if well, that person wanted to set up their own religion, they should be able to do so. Um, so yeah, there is kind of a practical element there. So how many can you actually manage and you know what I mean yeah. uh, register? But in theory, it should be it's universal. So uh, but as I said, some governments have used that as an excuse to not register or recognise any more religions because they don't want to. <laughs> and she looks like the criteria. Because you can't yeah. really categorize religion as it needs to fulfill the Well, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the problem. You know, um, one of the issues is that states often define religions but very narrowly. Um, so they may say you have to believe in God, for example, to be a religion. But what about Buddhism, for example? That some parts of Buddhism even though it's a religion, they don't necessarily believe in God um, or they're kind of like non-theistic religions, they don't place an emphasis on God. So again, it's like you said, where are we going to draw the line? Um, I would say try and be as inclusive as possible. Uh, and it is doable. Uh, it may not seem like it, but it is doable to be inclusive and include all belief groups, as I was saying earlier, religious, spiritual and philosophical. Yeah. Uh, but as you said, you know, there needs to be criteria, but it needs to be inclusive as possible. But in most countries today, 
it's very exclusive. They've got very narrow ideas of what the religion should be. So, yeah. <laughs> um, any further questions? Any further ones? Yes, I might have to. Is it like easier for like pre-existing religions, for the, like new religious movements to set up groups if they're um, so like their primary doctrine is yeah. like, or say like uh, Christianity or like yeah. Judaism? Is that easier for them to set up groups in? Or uh, like well, no, not necessarily because if you look at like the Jehovah's Witnesses, they classify themselves as Christians, but they've suffered quite heavily in, in trying to get recognition because the non-Trinitarian group, um, so they're a kind of Christian minority uh, in that sense. So, um, but yeah, if it's if it's a group like, I don't know, Catholics, for example, yeah, they might find it a bit easier, uh, but even in countries, um, I'm trying to think like um, some really, maybe like Saudi Arabia, for example, uh, the Catholic Church hasn't been able to set up a, a religious organisation there because there are no um, legal procedures for it to do so. So even in some countries, something like the Catholic Church still hasn't been able to, to set up um, any kind of legal personality. And it's also had issues in China as well in setting up kind of um, legal personality. So it doesn't necessarily mean that, but yeah, it's a good question though, thank you. And yourself? Yes. And uh, I wanted to know about what is the in Matthew. 